Welcome to this edition of Exeter Explains and today we're going to talk about failure rates and failure rates from the IEC 61511 perspective. So understanding where the failure rates come from, why we need to make sure that we have valid failure rates and what do we mean by valid failure rates. So firstly, just to familiarize ourselves again, we use the Greek symbol lambda to indicate a failure rate. And a failure rate is a number of failures per unit operating hours. So sometimes failure rates are expressed in terms of a per hour, for example, 5.6 times 10 to the minus 7 per hour or we might show it in terms of the failures in time or failure units in time known as FIT, which would then be 650 FITs. One FIT is a billion hours and per hour is to the minus nine. So we abbreviate that with the, ter with the term FIT, F-I-T-S. And as we shall see, failure rate varies with time but what we do in, in our probabilistic analysis is that we approximate with a constant number based on an average over a fairly lengthy period of time. So let's put that into perspective. Why do we do that? And the reason is because most reliability engineers will understand how failures occur with devices or products and what tends to happen is it tends to start off fairly high, drops down and then sort of flattens off before at some point in time ramping back up. So these would be failures and this of course would be time. So it's important because typically what happens at this point is we get normally get a high number of failures at here and, and this is referred to as infant mortality and most manufacturers understand this so what they tend to do is they tend to do cycle testing with heating or vibration or shock or some means of being able to wheedle out the weaker units before they get into circulation. So in other words, the manufacturers don't want to have a high number of returns during the warranty period. So they will do this. And then you see what happens here. We sort of flatten out over time where the failure rates tend to be more or less constant. And then at this point in the future, they start to ramp up again. And this part is known as wear out. So this is where eventually the normal stresses and strains of the environment and the operation for the device or the equipment is it overcomes the strength of the product and eventually it wears out. But the important thing is what happens here in the middle. And what happens here in the middle, of course, is that we can see if we take an average over this period of time, I apologize, my drawing is not up to scratch, but you can see here, this is relatively pessimistic. Not that pessimistic, but it's conservative, let's say. But you can see during this period we can assume constant failure rate during this period of time. And this period of time is known as useful life. And this is why it's so important that we monitor and track the useful life. Because in our probabilistic analysis, everything we do is predicated on this concept of constant failure rate during useful life. So if we get out here, 
we no longer have a constant failure rate, it's unpredictable, and of course this is what happens if you have a run to fail philosophy. So it's very important that we have to understand and track our useful life. So when we talk about failure rates from the point of view of the of the IEC 61511 application, where for use in the calculations for our PFD average or PFH, these are based upon the random failures and these failures are based upon the fact that we're using equipment within its useful life where we can rely on the failure rate information we're being given. So where do the failure rates come from? There's two fundamental ways of us being able to obtain failure rate data of course is through estimation. We can use estimation techniques to estimate our lander based upon failure data. We can do prediction, failure rate prediction, based upon either real test results or design strength analysis. For example, the FAMIDA approach, the failure mode effects and diagnostics analysis. This is a technique that uses a predictive model to be able to calculate an overall failure rate for a piece of equipment or a device. And usually FAMIDA results are slightly more conservative, but they're still very much within the same region as we see with test data or other techniques. And typically where the failure rates come from would be manufacturers field failure studies and industry databases or end user field data studies. The problem with manufacturers field failure studies is that we typically really don't know how many devices are actually returned to the, the manufacturer, especially once it's outside of warranty and it very much depends upon the type of device. Typically for a sensor, for example, most end users I talk to, they, they won't send it back to the manufacturer, they'll just toss it, get another one. So manufacturers field studies have to be looked at carefully because number one, we really don't know truly how many modules have failed and what's been returned. And then secondly, the number of operating hours. So here again, a lot of the times manufacturers will assume as soon as they've shipped it, that's when the clock starts ticking. And so typically what a lot of manufacturers do is they will look at the volume they've manufactured of the device or whatever it happens to be, the date they started doing that, how many devices have been shipped, how many have been returned, how many of those returned, had failures and so forth. And then they would calculate a time based on that volume of equipment that's shipped, that's shipped rather, and then figure out a failure rate. The problem with doing that is you're going to end up with very overly optimistic results. The other problem, of course, or the other challenge is what happens if a device is sent back to a manufacturer and no faults found? Is the manufacturer going to classify that as being a failure or not? Typically, most of the time, if they can't find a fault, it won't be classified as a failure. Industry databases are useful to refer to, but again, you have to look at, at the type of equipment. So for example, in the 60s and 70s, there was a lot of data collected by the military and of course, telecommunications. But here again, if we're looking at equipment that's going offshore, for example, then we wouldn't necessarily use that as a reference. We would probably go to the OREDA, which is the Offshore Reliability Equipment Database, and look at that. End user field studies, of course, the best source is from the end user sites, but again, half the problem is the systems used to document and to track failures, and also the methods. It's not usually consistent, and so sometimes, again, you have to be careful with field failure data. So these are, these are the sources of where, the, where it can come from. What happened in 2016 was that IEC 615.11 had this clause added, 11.9.3, which now says the reliability data used when quantifying the effect of random failures, in other words, when we're doing 
our PFD average calculations or our PFH calculations, depending on whether it's low demand or if it's high or continuous. That data has to be credible, it has to be traceable, it's got to be documented and justified. And again, should be based on field feedback from similar devices used in a similar operating environment. So this is, this is pretty strong language. And the reason this has been put in is because there have been instances like this. You can see on the chart that we have circles, green circles, black circle, and the, the little triangles. This is data that's been gathered on, in this particular case, solenoid valves. And you can see that there's the Fermita data, which Exeter uses, is slightly more conservative when compared to the Orida data, the Dow data, and a pipeline company uh, data as well. And if you look down below that at the red circles, you can see those are showing much, much lower failure rates. And the problem with this is that those red ones can't be that much better than the, the standard or what a lot of industry is seeing. So why is that? And again, it depends upon where the source of data is coming from. If it's manufacturer field failure data, it needs to be triaged properly. It needs to be looked at. There needs to be consideration given to what realistically is the number of hours that we could use and typically how much or how many devices or what equipment has been returned or not. So if you don't take a view with that, you can end up again with very low failure rates. And these failure rates here do not meet those four requirements of clause 1193. It's not credible, it's not traceable, it's not documented, not justifiable. So we have to be very careful with looking at certificates, looking at the failure rate data on the certificates. So here again, we can see that the failure rates are much, much lower than we would expect to see. And one of the other things that you can use as a source of comparison is there's a website called SILSAFE Data, www.silsafedata.com. And this will give you some boundaries. It'll give you a lower boundary and an upper boundary of what you would expect to see in terms of the failure rates for these types of devices. So this is not going to be justifiable or credible. So if you look at SILSAFE data, for example, if we looked at a, a typical um, poppet type device, solenoid valve poppet three-way, you can see that there's an upper limit for the number of fits in this case and a lower limit. And then you can see what it is for a spool valve and if we look here, we can see this would be the limit, lower limit for a poppet solenoid valve in low demand again. And this would be the limit for the spool valve again in low demand. So the red dots don't fall within that. And we would have to look very carefully at, at where did those numbers come from? Because they're much lower than expected. So again, we need to be careful. We need to make sure that the failure rate data we're using in our calculations complies with the 1193 clause so that we make sure we can justify the numbers we're using. So I hope you found that useful. Any questions, please let us know. We always like to hear from you. Thank you for listening and look forward to the next time.